Before viewing video lessons, it is important to read the textbook using the learning guide as your turn-by-turn -turn directions. Then, use the learning guide to take organized notes in your own words with examples and pictures. Chapter 2, Psychological Research, Research Ethics. The scientific process involves a general question or problem. The scientist then becomes educated about that problem based on theories and previous research findings. The scientist then creates a testable hypothesis with operational definitions. Once you have a hypothesis, the next step is to select an ethical research method and design the study. There are three different designs that can be chosen, descriptive, correlational, or experimental. The design that is selected depends on the hypothesis, but also ethics and practicality. We are going to focus on ethics. The American Psychological Association is the largest professional organization of psychologists in the United States. They have created ethical standards for research. These standards ensure both human and animal subjects are treated with dignity. There are six ethical guidelines. These are going to be presented in a slightly different order than in the textbook. So in the textbook they're numbered 1 through 6 and they're presented in that order. I like to start with number 6 because this is actually the first thing all scientists must do if they're doing research with people or animals. And this one has to do with getting approval of the research study before it's conducted from an institutional review board. All psychological research has to be approved by a board. This board is usually at the institution the scientists work at. Most science is conducted in association with colleges and universities. So in the case of Jefferson College, a scientist would go to the Jefferson College Institutional Review Board to have their study approved before they began. The main job of the Institutional Review Board is to ensure that the study is set up to uh, be ethical. In the case of human research, there are four keys that the IRB or Institutional Review Board will be looking at. The first thing with human research is the participants must be voluntary. They must have volunteered for the study. You can't force someone to participate in psychological research. You also can't coerce them. You can't sort of manipulate them. Um, another part of being voluntary is something called informed consent. That means if I'm volunteering for something, I have to know generally what's going to happen before I agree to it. Now this particular guideline I think goes hand in hand with number three which is deception in psychological research. According to the APA, according to the APA, deception is okay sometimes. Deception means I have to inform you, but I don't have to tell you everything. Um, one of the things that we found in, in uh, psychological research is that if you tell people what you're looking for, it can alter their behavior in the research, and then you don't get a true measure of their actual behavior. And so sometimes we don't inform the research participants of every little aspect of the study, particularly if them knowing about it would change how they acted. And so it's okay to deceive, but after the research study is complete, participants have to be informed of the deception. 
Okay, the next principle that an IRB would consider with human research has to do with harm. So principle two, guideline two, says that in research, no physical or psychological harm can come to humans. Now that word harm is very important. Harm in this case means permanent damage. So what that means is I can inflict a discomfort, I can make you uncomfortable, I can even hurt you if it's kind of a temporary hurt, but what I'm not allowed to do is harm you in a way that would be permanent. I think one good illustration of this has to do with a line of research dealing with how stress um, affects the immune system. And so there's been several studies. Um, one study that was done with college students involved asking the students to come into a laboratory and then they were given blisters intentionally on their arms. They were given a series of sort of standardized sores on their arm. And then they were asked to come back in periodically and have the sores healing process checked. And they gave students these sores at different points in the semester. And one of the things that they found was that the sores healed relatively quickly towards the beginning of the semester, the first couple of weeks, those sores went away very fast. But towards the end of the semester, when it was getting close to final exam time, the sores took much longer to heal. And the stress level the students reported was much higher during that time. So in that particular research study, people were hurt they were given sores on purpose, but they were not intentionally or permanently harmed. The last of the categories that the Institutional Review Board would need to consider for psychological research with humans would be the right to privacy. So this would be guideline number four. So when we do research with people, we are not allowed to reveal that person's name or identifying information. The one exception to that is that psychologists are what are sometimes referred to as mandated reporters of abuse. This is similar to teachers and other professionals. And so if somehow in the course of the research study the researcher becomes aware of some abuse occurring, so for example they are doing uh, research with children and one of the children in an interview reported being abused they would have to break confidentiality and report that to the authorities, but they would not be able to print that person's name up in the research study. So those are the four guidelines for research that would have to be considered by an institutional review board looking at research with people. Now, if the research is with animals, there is just one guideline, and this is guideline number five. This one says that animals must be treated humanely. This means that they must be kept in clean pens with the proper amount of space, uh, food, those sorts of things. Now what makes animal research and human research different is the second half of this principle and that is that animals may be harm if the knowledge to be gained is thoroughly justified. So I cannot permanently harm a person but I can permanently harm to include kill an animal in research if what I would find out is what is of great enough value. So the question is who decides if the harm is justified? That's the role of the Institutional Review Board. So the Institutional Review Board decides is the knowledge to be gained going to be uh, enough to justify the harm to include death. And so they'll have you know somewhat different standards if it's just going to be 
harmed but able to still live fairly normally, or harmed and killed. Now, in the world of psychology, as well as the general public, there's a little bit of controversy about deceiving people in research, but what we find is that, generally speaking, when we tell people after the research about the deception, they are not upset and they understand the reason for it and they're not, uh, not too upset about that. The other area of the ethics code where there's um, some controversy both within psychology and the general public has to do with the different standard for animals versus people when it comes to harm. And what I always like to say about this particular standard for research is that in the general public, in the world today, in the state of history we are in at this moment, we have different rules for animals and people. For example, if I go into my classroom to teach a class and I find a student that's in the room that doesn't belong there, I am not allowed or encouraged to kill that student because they're in the wrong place. I would simply say, hey, you're in the wrong classroom, please leave. If I went into the classroom and there was a rat, then not only would I be required by law to remove that rat, the law would be pretty okay if I killed it. And so those are sort of you know, the way the world distinguishes and treats animals and people differently. And psychology, which evolves in a socio-historical context, reflects the times. And so right now, animals have a different standard than people. Is it possible that someday there may be just one standard that's the same? It's possible. The world may change in that regard. But right now, there are different standards for research with animals and people. So we're about halfway through choosing a ethical research method and design. 